All right, with that said, our text this morning is going to come from uh, Daniel chapter 4, 29 to 37, 29 to 37. And today's uh, we've been in the, a series called The Seven Deadly Sins. And if you guys have been following us up to now, today is actually our last uh, seven deadly sin, which is pride. And I saved this one last because I think it stands at the, the center of all the other six sins that we've been talking about. I mean, if you think about it, right, uh, envy is not wanting others to have things that are better, better than us or, or greed, which is our attempt to build our significance or our beauty off of material things. Anger, right? When when things are not in our control, or when somebody offends us, or, or something like that, there's there's gluttony, lust, and sloth. All these things are are kind of connected to our individual being when we become the center of our lives. And this is kind of where pride is at. And this is the last seven deadly sin um, that we're going to tackle today. So our text this morning is going to come from Daniel, as I said. And let me read this to you guys. Verse twenty nine. At the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. And the king answered and said, Is not this great Babylon, which I have built by my mighty power as a royal residence and for the glory of my majesty? While the words were still in the king's mouth, there a fell a voice from heaven, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken, the kingdom has departed from you and you shall be driven from among men. And your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and you shall be made to eat grass like an ox. And seven periods of time shall pass over you until you know that the Most High rules the kingdom of men and gives it to whom he will. Immediately, the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men and ate like ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers, and his nails were like bird's claws. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation all the inhabitants, inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can say, stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me. My counselors and my Lord sought me, and I was established in my kingdom, and still more greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are right and his ways are just, and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's take a moment of prayer. Dear God, I just pray that you may open up our ears and our hearts to receive your words, O Lord, and they, may they challenge us and also comfort us. And Lord, I just pray that with that, O Lord, that you may humble us before you, May we be able to see your grace and your awesome works in our lives, O Lord. And may we just drop down and praise you, O Lord. I just pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts may be holy and pleasing to you, Lord. May your gospel be preached and may your spirit work in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, as we talked about um, this whole thing called pride, we really do believe it's like the engine behind all the other sins as we've talked about in the introduction. I mean, it really does like it really does like move everything else, right? Like envy, we envy because of our pride or we have greed because of our pride. See, in Western Christianity, pride is known to be the root of all evils. St. Augustine, who is one of the early church fathers, uh, a theologian, he says this, it was pride that changed angels into devils. And it will be humility that makes men into angels. See, pride is a sin that has caused Adam and Eve to fall um, from the beginning of time. I mean, we said this with a lot of other sins because they're all kind of connected. And this is when this, the serpent comes and tempts humanity saying, hey, you eat this and you'll be like God. You can be independent from him. You can know what he knows. You can be the judge of your own life. Take this. And with that, you know, the fruit is eaten and sin enters the world. See, pride has this way of wanting the world to revolve around me, myself, and I. And at the core, you know, pride is kind of like the self-centeredness that is untamed, and it forgets about God and forgets about everybody else in our lives. I mean, it's just on us. And the reason why pride is so dangerous is because it stands at the opposite of our actual purpose in life. You know, by design, the world is more than just about us or just about me. 
Our purpose in life over and over again in scripture reminds us is to love God, to seek him. And then with the love we receive from God, we're called to give it to the world, right? Love God and love others. Love God and love others. I mean, we had an entire sermon series on this, which is talking about the greatest commandment in scripture. But the thing about pride is it stops that from happening because it blinds us from seeing God and others. You know, a common thing that we talked about a lot all throughout this time and even in a lot of sermons, actually, is that we all worship something, right? Every per- it, it, it doesn't mean you have to be religious to worship something. We all worship something. We all have a God or an idol in our life. We always work for something. We always revolve our lives around something. We, and no one worships nothing. We all serve something. But pride is the one where we st- kind of stand there and we're like, I, I, it, the spotlight's on us. And of course, there's also healthy pride. Don't get me wrong. I mean, calling pride a sin is not like acting like you're not worthy of anything. Like it's, we're, not, we're not called to go in front of a mirror and be like horrible, horrible, like every day. And, and that's how we get humility. You know, that's not the point. I mean, there's good pride. We, there's pride that comes when we're confident in who we are. We have pride in our gifts. We have, we have confidence in, as children of God. We, and, and, you know, we have confidence in the hard work that we put in. There's pride when we have our blessings and we're filled up with gratitude and joy. There's pride that motivates us for a higher purpose, namely pride in our God who is worthy of it. But when the church fathers were describing the faces of pride in people's lives, they were talking about the ones that destroy a person, destroy a person. The ones that are in things not worthy of worship. And when we do, we destroy ourselves and a lot of other things there's two categories of of pride that are talked about often one is vain glory and the other is hubris Um, i actually have some typos on this but anyways vain glory is this idea vain glory means empty glory it's kind of like this idea of narcissism where we constantly think too much about ourselves um, and the word narcissism comes from the legend of Narcissus. Have you guys ever heard of this? He's a, he was a hunter who was renowned for his good looks. And they said that he, he thought about himself so much or, you know, he looked at himself so much that he couldn't even get with women because he thought no one was good enough. And, he, you know, he only looked at himself. So a god named, a goddess named Nemesis one day saw his character and decided to punish him. And this is the way she did it. She brought him to a reflecting pond where you can see his reflection. And the legend has it that he stared so much that he eventually drowned in in the pool. This is this is why narcissism, the word, comes out from. And also hubris uh, is another word. It's rooted in the idea of humanism. This is not the sin that thinks too much about oneself. This is what it should be up there. But it's the idea of thinking too highly of oneself, highly of oneself. They take pride in, in, in what they have accomplished so much to the point where they look down on others. I mean, hubris is kind of that feeling where you can't receive help from anyone else just because you don't think people can help you. Or, 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 you know, you take pride in your independence. And it's really easy to get people with hubris to do things, right? All you got to do is poke at their pride. You know, growing up, the way you got guys to do things is like, what, you, what, you scared? And you're just like, oh, no, I'm not scared. I'll, I'll do pull-ups off of that bridge. I actually did this. Like, it was stupid. Like, off of Chelton and Mamaw's own pull-ups just because I thought... You know, go crazy, like, man, like, so stupid. But this is where we find our main character, King Nebuchadnezzar. There are some things you need to know about this guy. If anything, this guy, in a worldly sense, has accomplished so much. Maybe it's not so much empty glory. I mean, because he was literally the master of the world. He was a king of Babylon, which was the greatest empire during that time period. There was the richest and the strongest. And the king was known to be the type that flaunts his greatness. I mean, he literally built Babylon to be his his personal playground. I mean, have you guys ever heard of the seven wonders of the world and, and one of them being the hanging gardens of Babylon? I mean, he basically built a tropical paradise in the middle of the desert that was elevated above all the all the desert dry land. And they didn't even have plumbing systems back then, but they had a full waterfall there along with rivers and streams and all this greenness in the middle of the desert. I mean, this is this is crazy. And this is what I imagine King Nebuchadnezzar is looking at when he says, is this not my great Babylon, which I built with my power, my royal residence, my glory? Another thing that you have to keep in mind, it's not just Nebuchadnezzar, but it's the entire Babylonian Empire. They were known for this type of self-orientation. You guys remember the Tower of Babel? For those of you guys who don't, this is a story in Genesis where a bunch of guys, a bunch of humans come together and they're like, yo, let's build a tower that reaches heaven because we're going to build a name for ourselves. And God's like, yo, 
build a name for yourselves. What, what are we, and then he confuses their languages and they disperse. But this is kind of the root of Babylon, Babel, Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar is the king of that. He's a CEO of that empire. You know, but if we look at human history or the history of the Bible, we learn that pride is always leading to the destruction of mankind. Because not only does God punish the arrogant, but in all actuality, it's interesting because sometimes God doesn't need to do that because pride in and of itself is self-destructive. I mean, maybe some of you guys know someone in your life, like you've seen this, right? Because of their pride, they had lost everything. Because of their pride, they lost their marriage. Because of their pride, they lost the love of their children. You know, Pope Gregory said this, pride is a tumor of the soul filled with pus. When it is ripened, it will rupture and create a disgusting mess. And he's talking about this like based off of like Proverbs, right? Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. First Peter 5.5 5 says this, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. You know, I, I mentioned this, uh, a book I read, I forget which sermon I've mentioned this, but I just want to read it again, just because I thought it was, uh, it was great. It was by De Gene Twang and Keith Campbell. It's, it's from the Narcissism Epidemic, and this is what they wrote. Understanding the narcissism epidemic is important because its long-term consequences are destructive to society. American culture's focus on self-admiration has caused a flight from reality to the land of grandiose fantasy. We have phony rich people with interest-only mortgages and piles of debt. We have phony beauty with plastic surgery and cosmetic procedures. Phony athletes with perform-enhancing drugs. Phony celebrities via reality TV and YouTube. Phony genius students with great inflation. They said inflate, great inflation has gone so much up. A phony national economy with $11 trillion of government debt is probably a lot higher now. Phony feelings of being special among children with parenting and education focused on self-esteem. We have phony children with the social networking explosion. And all this fantasy might feel good, but unfortunately, reality always wins. And, you know, this, this guy was writing a book, and he basically talks about, like, this whole idea of narcissism. Is, it's almost like eating a, a plate full of chocolate cake versus eating, like, broccoli or something. And he says, you know, at first, when you eat that chocolate, it feels good. You feel energetic. You feel the sugar rush. You feel like everything's going to be good. But when time goes by, you hit the crash. You find that you have cavities. You find that you've got a lot of extra weight, and your health is going down the drain. On the other hand, when you eat broccoli, you don't get that rush. At first, you might feel horrible doing it. It doesn't taste good, but your body gets real energy. See, pride follows a type of animal instinct where you can't see past the immediate good rush. But in actuality, you're just kind of eating emptiness. This is why our passage says, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, this message is for you. This is from, from God to, to, through Daniel. You are no longer the ruler of this kingdom. You'll be driven out, driven from human society. You will live in the fields with the wild animals, and you will eat grass like a cow. See, Daniel is a prophet from God. He's the guy that survived the, 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 what do you call it, the lion's den, right? And he's saying this to the most powerful man in the world. And God is basically saying through da Daniel, pride will lead you to losing everything. And you're going to be at the level of an animal. And it's funny because as I, was, as I was reading this, I began to imagine animal instincts of pride, right? Wildlife. Have you guys ever looked, looked at a peacock? Like peacocks are, they're, they're said to be beautiful. You know, they got, you know, peacocks. And during mating season, they said, that, that, you know, peacocks open up their wings and they strut. At first, when you look at it, you're like, wow, that's so beautiful. But if you keep looking at them, like the way they strut and things like that, they're like, yo, that's arrogance at his, at his tee. They keep strutting and they keep doing it. And when other peacocks come along the way, they fight and they get mad and, and you know, they get pretty, pretty nasty. I mean, but I think these are the, the, the animal instincts, right? I mean, we can see this, like guys that are always trying to prove themselves. At first you look good, but you keep looking closer. You're like, oh, man, it's not that good. It really isn't. And the crazy thing is most people don't care. You know, there was an experiment done in South Korea where they asked a few people to wear ridiculous outfits. And I thought it was funny because I'm wearing something like this. And I guarantee you guys, at first you thought it was funny, but after that, you guys don't notice at all, right? Like it's kind of up here. And, you know, they were like, no, I'm never going to wear that out there. People are going to think I'm crazy. And, you know, they had different writings on it and stuff like that that would be kind of absurd. And, you know, they had these people wear these, and they went out. And then they asked everybody else, did you guys notice somebody out there looking at you? And they're like, no, we didn't notice anything. Like, 
you know, there's a surprise. We, we think everyone's looking at us, but no, one's, no one noticed. But this is why pride is so deadly. There's, there's three things that I'm going to talk about today. Pride. One, pride hurts ourselves. Two, pride hurts our relationships with others. And three, this is the most important, pride kills our relationship with God. Pride hurts ourselves. We talked about a lot about this already. Pride not only hurts us because it leads us to, to do the other sins, as we learned before throughout the entire sermon series, but it also stops us from learning and growing to change for the better. If you guys look at our passage, there's actually a prequel to it. Verse 29 says this, At the end of 12 months, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon. Before this ever happens, in the, in the chapters before, about one year ago, King Nebuchadnezzar called in Daniel to interpret a second dream. And in this dream, he had a dream about this huge tree that grew up all the way up into the heavens. It was a huge tree, and its branches gave shade to the whole earth. And, and you know, a fabulous, awesome tree. But in that same tree, he says, a man from heaven comes down and orders it to be chopped down. And then that tree is chopped down, and there, it's just a stump that lives amongst animals. And when he's like, oh, what does this mean? Daniel says, hey, king. And in fact, you know, Daniel's a very strong guy, but he was actually really worried. He was like, king, this is, this is you. You're the huge tree. This is your empire. And if you don't recognize God, if you don't practice righteousness, if you don't show mercy to those who have the need, if you don't have humility, God is not going to have mercy on you. But notice this. A year later, nothing changes. Even after the warning from Daniel, the king doesn't listen. In fact, a year later, he's still on top of this big tree admiring himself. And this is the self-destructive nature of pride, that even when warned, it doesn't listen. In fact, the proud are so blind by their own weakness, uh, blind to their own weaknesses and flaws. I mean, like, it, it's a prideful attitude that thinks it needs no improvement or correction, or even if they do know it, they don't want to admit it, so they never learn. My gosh, but what a bad state to be in. You know, it's always known that Daniel had a deep love for the country he was in. I mean, everybody hates Babylon, but Daniel was a great citizen. He's always known for that. And when he's coming to the king, giving him these advices, he's saying it with a heart of, uh, uh, of, of love. He's like, king, you got to change this. You know, when I was reading this, man, like, it, it dawned on me. There's people in our lives, right? Sometimes people in our lives that God places into us that speaks truth to us, but we never like it, man. Like, you just, whether it's our, our parents or our siblings or our pastor, I don't know, or, or, or someone at church or somebody that always has something, something to say about you. And you don't like it because they, but you know what I realized, man, those people in our lives, like how many of them do we really have? Really? Really? You know, I realize in this world, most people just don't care enough to speak truth to us. So that means if we do have them, we should listen. But this is, this is a sad state, Right. There's only one guy that could ever say this to, to the king, but he just won't listen. And what comes next? He, uh, he obviously, he, he, he eats like an animal, and that prophecy comes true. But pride also, not only does it hurt ourselves, but it also hurts our relationships with others. I mean, I think it's kind of obvious, right? Pride blinds you from seeing others. You know, that's why when God was rebuking Nebuchadnezzar of his pride, he's saying, have mercy on the oppressed. He was like, look at other people, please. See, when Babylonians took over everything, they did it in their name. They destroyed all their nations. They even imported people from other nations to make their nation great. I mean, pride has one agenda. It's always themselves. But you, you see the destructive nature of, of pride in relationships, right? Pride causes jealousy. Pride causes anger. It causes all these other things, that, and it destroys relationships. But pride also has an effect on our relationships. Why? Because no one likes a prideful person. No one does. I mean, prideful, the prideful are those that can't tame their emotions. They're often the loneliest people. I mean, don't, I mean, we always hate the peacocks in our life, right? Like, man, there he goes, like, flaunting his, his wings again, you know? We, we don't like it. We don't like them. And I think we can all agree that we, we don't like people with those tendencies, right? We hate people who think too highly of themselves. We, we don't like people that take all the credit. We, we hate those that look down on others and, 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 and people that criticize. We hate those that are stubborn. But the truth is this, it's so easy to see it in everyone else, but at times it's so hard to detect it in our own lives. I mean, pride is like a cycle, right? Prideful people hate prideful people. If you don't like prideful people, it's most likely because you know what that heart is. 
You know, it's ironic because we love the sin when we have it, but we hate it when it's in others. And I think it's a part of being made in God's image. Like, we're drawn to humility. So when we don't see it in others, it bothers us. But it's so hard to, to see it in ourselves. You know, the world doesn't like arrogant people, but we want to be in a place of arrogance. Tell me not. Like, we want to be the peacock. You know, C.S. Lewis, he once said this, and I thought it was great. He said this. There is one vice of which no man in the world is free which everyone in the world loathes when he sees it in someone else and of which hardly any people except Christians or, or if you really know what the Christian message is ever imagine that they're guilty of themselves. Pride. Pride leads to every other vice and it is a complete anti-God state of mind. Guys, you know, it, it's really interesting when you look at this idea of humility and where that actually comes from. It, it really is rooted in the Christian message where, where people are like, wow, because there's a God, I have to be humble. Or else, you know, you're on that, uh, that, that opposite trend. Well, bouncing off what C.S. Lewis quote is at the end of the day, pride is the most dangerous because it hurts your relationship with God. It is that anti-God state of anti -God state of mind. See, the problem is that pride in its ultimate form doesn't recognize sin or grace. It doesn't recognize God nor what he has done for us. See, the other sins hinder us from, from God and the gospel, but this one is unable to see God in others. So what is a cure? I guess the answer is really easy, right? Humility. Guys, go be humble. Uh, message over. So easy, right? I mean, like every other sin that we discussed, the cure for pride is to recognize God's grace, in which in this case brings humility. But the funny thing is, have you guys ever tried to teach a lifestyle of, of humility? I mean, who do we point to? Who do we point to? I mean, do I point to myself, guys, you got to be humble like me, like the humblest guy in the world. Or, or what do we do? Like, how do we do this? And the moment we think we're not humble and the moment that we think we have it, it's funny because pride jumps right back in. I mean, it's so pervasive. I mean, in all honesty, I mean, Christian preachers have been preaching against pride for centuries, but it never goes away. I mean, pride is one of those things that you can preach a sermon against pride while having pride that you've preached a sermon against it. You know, the, the Amish community separated themselves from the world because they saw these things. They're like, we don't want pride. We don't want to struggle with these things. We're going to avoid technology. We're going to avoid, we're going to wear plain clothes. And we're, we're not going to feel this type of person. We're going, to, we're going to forget everything in this world. But you know what? Pride is so sneaky that you can have pride and not having pride. And it, it's funny because, you know, it, it just keeps going. It's the deadliest sin because it is a sin that finds its way into every good deed and every heart motive. Have you guys ever heard of the phrase, right? There's no such thing as a selfless good deed. No such thing as a selfless good deed. Because you guys do something good. Ultimately, we, we want that pat on the shoulder <laughs> or we want something from it. And if you think about even the good things that we do, if we don't get recognized for it, I mean, we love the credit, but this is why pride even lives in those with low self-esteem. People think this is, oh, this is people with, uh, this is a problem for people with arrogance. I mean, yeah, but if you, if you suck at everything like me, you don't have pride. You know, I don't know, something like that. But, but pride even finds itself in the lack of arrogance or the lack of confidence. It's found in people that are anxious. It's people found, it's found in people that have low self-esteem. How? Because all the people have the same desires. It's just that one is good at getting it while the other is not. You know, in our elder training there's, there, that we were going through, there's a section that talked about something called arrogant pride and something called fearful pride. And, you know, I thought it was like, all right, it's pretty cool. And I was looking down the list, and, and everything that I thought was humble was actually in the fearful pride. And I was like sitting there, like almost like fell to the floor. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I do every one of these, every single one. And I was looking at this man like, Oh, I thought I was being humble when I was doing that. But I realized my fear and why I was being humble in those areas. You know, why does someone have, think about it, why does someone have low self-esteem? It's because they want all the things to be prideful. They want all the, the accomplishments. The heart is the same. The thing is, they're just not skilled at getting there. The same with an anxious heart. Why are they anxious? It's because they're scared that they're not going to perform. And therefore, they can't be prideful about it. I mean, it goes in circles, you know? And I was like, I was, when I was reading this, this elder training, I was like, oh my gosh, I got to repent. But there's only one way to be cured from this thing called pride. You know, a, a student of mine in the past came up to me once and um, after, after like learning about pride, she was like, you know, I've been 
wanting to be humble my entire life and I've been trying and trying only to realize that I, I can never get it. And I, I will never forget what she said. She was like, I realize that humility can't be tried to get, but it can only be received when you're humbled. And I was like, humbled? My gosh. And I thought about this for a while, even, even before writing the sermon. I'm mean, what does it mean to be humbled? I mean, there's two ways, right? One, you can be humiliated and be totally humbled, or you can be humbled. And I was looking at this, and look at Nebuchadnezzar. He couldn't bring humility upon himself, so he was what? He was humiliated. In fact, in verse 33, it says, Immediately the word was fulfilled against Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among men. He ate grass like an ox, and his body was wet with dew from the heavens till his hair grew as long as eagle's feathers, and the nails were like bird claws. I mean, they're basically describing the ugliest state of being that you can be. And he's humbled because he's humiliated. It's, it's realizing that, that, that you're nothing without God, and you're nothing but a bunch of random cells congregated together to somehow make life if, if God is not there. And he's being humiliated for it. But there's a second way to do it. And I really hope that this is the way we can get, get humbled. You can receive humility by simply recognizing the gifts of God. The gifts of God. It's recognizing that everything that you have is not your own, but is a gift from God. Man, like, you know, oftentimes these days, especially um, for those who say that they believe in the gospel and even to uh, a lot of the people that are going through membership classes and inter interviews and, and even, you know, when I, even people that have been at church their whole life, I often ask this just because. Just I ask them, what do you say? Um, what do you say when you're after you die and you face the judge of the world and he asks you, why should I let you in heaven? How do you answer that question? I mean, what do you say? I mean, for me, I would be like, yo, I was a pastor my whole life. I preached your message all, like, every week. What's up, God? Like, you got to throw me a bone, right? I mean, I've done it better than most people, I think. I mean, what are you going to say? Like, I, I've raised my kid very gospel-centered, and, and, and they're beautiful now. Or what are you going to say, you know? Because I, I feel like God can always come back and be like, yo, like, that good thing you did, you didn't receive recognition for it, didn't you do that for yourself? What have you really done for me? But the truth is, there is nothing that we can say that will justify us to get into heaven besides the one thing that we can say. It is only by your grace, God, only by your mercy of what you've shown me, only by the goodness that you offer to me through Christ's life and death and resurrection that I can stand here. I mean, that's the only thing we can say. But humility is recognizing that. that by yourself, you're not perfect, you're a sinner. And it's saying, Christ. You're my only hope and salvation. Oh my gosh, it's a simple gospel message, but it's the only thing that can hum humble us. Understanding grace changes our heart. And grace helps us to realize how bad we are, yet how loved we are. We can never make ourselves better at this thing called pride by trying to be humbled. But it's only received by meeting the perfect person. It's because when you're standing beside them, the best and the, the most purest person, namely God himself in Christ, will you realize how small you are? And, you, and through that, you're, you're humbled to see the gifts that you receive. See, see how King Nebuchadnezzar is humbled after his humili humiliation. Just look at this. And third, verse 34 says this, At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation beyond me. And all the inhabitants of earth are accounted as nothing. And he does according to his will among the hosts of heaven and amongst the inhabitants of the earth. And none can say, stay his hand and say to him, what have you done? Notice this. What amazes me is he says, when reason returned to me. This is a moment when he realizes truth and he logically saw truth. That him being the most powerful nation in the world and the king of it was not because he was great, but because it was God ordained. You know, guys, pride is stupid because it doesn't see the entire picture. You know, at first, at first King Nebuchadnezzar goes and says, oh, look at this great Babylon. It's because of me. And then after he realizes truth, he was like, oh, my gosh, we're counted as nothing. It's all according to his will. You know, a, a lot of time pride comes into our hearts because we think we are self-made, but we're fools. Are we really self-made? I mean, it, is everything that we accomplish in life because we're good and smart? You know, even the most brilliant people and successful people um, one guy that I knew, uh, uh, 
MIT professor. I mean, he, he accomplished so much. And I, I remember in one of our conversations, he said this, you know, everything I've done in life was because of luck. And I was like, what do you mean? And he starts naming a series of people that he met throughout life that changed the course of his life. You know, he was an immigrant that, that, that came out of, um, uh, I guess, the communist movement back then. And, you know, he came to America and he was like, I met this one guy. He, he got me into school. I met this other guy. He got me into a Ph.D. program. I met this other guy and, and I became a professor. And he was like, none, none of it was because of me. And I was like, oh, my gosh, you're like the smartest guy I know. But even for him, he was like, it's out of my control. But if you really think about it, how much is really in our control? Did we choose the moment in history that we were born in? Did we choose the country we were born in? Did we choose our ethnicity? Did we choose our gender? Did we choose our family? What if we're not born at a time where public education were free? There's a lot of people that couldn't get education because it was never free before. But what if we're born in a time where, where all these other things that we have right now weren't there? Our health, our brains, our talents. We realize everything is a gift. And this is the logical reasoning, I think, that King Nebuchadnezzar was having. I mean, this is the humility that comes upon a soul when we, we're looking at everything. I mean, even as a church, I thank God every day when I see our ministry in our church. At least I try to every day. The people that he has brought in, the leaders that are serving. And I remind myself that it's not the efforts of any one pastor or any core group, but it's the blessings of the right people he sends to our ministry each day, each week. You know, I want to let's practice this for a moment. Let's let's turn to our neighbors next to us and say this. Thank you for being here. And let's also say this. Church would not be the same without you. And let's not say that in vain. Let's also keep the families that are sick right now in prayer. A lot of them are sick. Um, you know, there's a story that I'm kind of reminded of, of a girl and her mother. And, and it's a story about a girl that, that always had a bad relationship with her mother. Uh, she would complain when things didn't go her way. She would always want the best things in life. And she would complain if she didn't get fancy food or even a nice car, even though she drove a better car than her own parents. Um, and, and, you know, uh, so she was used to getting what she wanted, and she was really good at it. I mean, she got really good grades. Um, she got into an Ivy League school. She ended up um, going to a college that was kind of far, but it was really, really expensive. And she would be at school and would ask her mom to send her money, and the mother would always send her money. And she would complain to her mother again that she didn't have enough, and the mom would make things happen somehow. Granted that she did well in school as well. I mean, she got straight A's. Always 4.0. It's a part of all these different clubs, you know, receiving a lot of recognition in those areas. But there's one day that the next payment for the tu tuition was due. It was, it was late, and her school gave her a warning. And this girl got really annoyed. She was like, "You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna take a plane back home. I'm gonna I'm gonna face face my parents. Like, what the heck? What's going on?" So she takes a surprise trip back home and and tries to talk to her mother face to face. And as she got home, she realized that the house that she lived in had other people living in it. People, other people were there. Her family had moved, so she called her mom again, demanding for an explanation, and that led her to a small nearby apartment complex where they had moved. And it turns out that this mother had sold the house to pay for her Ivy League education so that she wouldn't have any school debt. She had given up everything, had been working overtime. She didn't need a place to even hang out because she was working all the time. And she had no idea what was going on in the background. And when she had seen all of this, she was humbled. You know, I think this is the same feeling that Nebuchadnezzar had and felt. And this is the same feeling that we have when we look at the gospel. You know, we always praise God, oh, joy to the world that the Savior came and all this. Man, this, when we step back and we, from our situations and we see the entire picture, we can't help but be humbled in the presence of God. It's no longer praising and worshiping and having good music to bring us emotion, but it's the story behind it. The story behind it that makes it so powerful. You know, this girl was so self-absorbed in what she wanted, she didn't see the behind scenes. We see some aspects of Christianity, we say big deal, but when we step back and see the whole picture of a God that loves us so much that he decided to humble himself and become humanity through his son Christ. Guys, this is what Christmas is. Advent, it's the humbling of our Lord Jesus, Lord God, to become a baby, not in a, born in, a, in royalty or a crazy rich person, 
but literally born in a barn, born by a poor teenage girl in a small town in the middle of nowhere. And this is why we had the nativity scenes and all of that. And he just doesn't come just to live on earth, but he comes to be tortured and nailed onto the cross that we may receive grace. How can we not be humble? How can we not turn back and love him and spread his eternal love that he gives to us? See, pride blinds us from that reality, but humility comes when we see the entire picture. I'm going to ask the praise team to come up. Um, I want to ask um, if you guys just can take a moment just to pray. Um, you know, as we reflect on, on, on Christmas and the new year, I know this sermon went a little long, but let's take a moment just to pray.